striking forces in the most momentous assault of all time were the paratroopers, scheduled to drop behind the enemy's lines. The 175,000 men who made up the air and ground forces for the cross-channel attack arrived at the various ports of embarkation on the English coast by June 3rd under heavy guard. The thousands of ships and small craft which comprised the invasion fleet were waiting in readiness to take aboard their human cargo. More than 4,000 ships and small craft were to ferry across the channel the men who were to land on the French coast on D-Day itself. To facilitate the advance of the troops once the invasion was launched, thousands of vehicles were loaded aboard the same ships which were to transport the men. On the days directly preceding D-Day, the southern coasts of England were alive with activity. The Allied invasion forces were bracing themselves for the mighty effort which at that moment was looked upon by many as the greatest military gamble in history. In spite of the vastness of the force of men and equipment involved in the attack, preparations for the departure of the assault units were conducted smoothly and efficiently. The last of the ships which were to participate in the D-Day assault were loaded to capacity, and the time for departure from the English coast was finally at hand. In the late afternoon of June 5th, D-Day minus one, all preparations finally ended. The invasion fleet moved into the channel and made ready to assume the intricate pattern of positions from which, the following morning, the invasion of the French coast of the Nazis' European fortress would be launched. The moment all the world was tensely awaiting was now only hours away. The plan was for three Allied airborne divisions to land behind the beaches to cut Nazi communications and disorganize the enemy. Then, some five hours later, the first Allied invasion troops were to storm ashore on a 50-mile stretch of the French coast bordering the English Channel. D-Day finally dawned. The weather was favorable. The attack on the French coast was stepped up. Air plan, already in execution, called for the progressive wearing down of the Luftwaffe and the destruction of critical points in the rail and highway systems, so as to isolate the coastal areas selected for assault. For D-Day, the air forces were charged with the responsibility of demolishing selected targets in the enemy's coastal defenses, of providing overhead cover, and rendering general fighter bomber support. The Nazi planes that got off the ground didn't get very far. The area got just as thorough a going over as an important German industrial region. Allied pilots gave it the A treatment. which were to carry GIs to reinforce the paratroopers were prepared for the takeoff. The first group of 51 gliders carried about 150 men, plus anti-tank weapons, to be landed before the beaches were invaded. In the early morning of June 6th, the first group of gliders was pulled off the ground and towed out across the channel to be cut loose over the area where the paratroopers had dropped earlier 
small fields in which they were forced to land caused serious losses. report came from the airborne units I had visited only a few hours earlier and was most encouraging in tone. San Mariclis was the first town to be captured by American paratroopers early on D-Day morning. In addition to seizing key spots to facilitate the advance of the major forces, the airborne troops proved invaluable as scouts. One of their most important functions was the determination of enemy strength throughout the French coastal provinces. Meanwhile, in the rough waters of the channel, the giant invasion fleet was proceeding carefully toward the French coast, carrying the greatest amphibious force in history. Virtually every type of Allied assault vessel was pressed into use for the operation. The invasion armada had a complement of 4,100 ships and small craft, and carried 150,000 troops, thousands of vehicles and weapons, and tons of supplies. In spite of close quarters in the channel, the vast invasion fleet made the crossing successfully, suffering the loss of not a single vessel by German action. With all in readiness and eight hour drawing close, the men rededicated their efforts. The GIs and the Navy gun crews waited expectantly for an enemy air attack. But strangely, there was none. One of the most important and dirtiest of preparatory jobs was done by the minesweepers, which moved in and exploded mines just off the coast, clearing safe channels for the assault boats. Losses among the 200 minesweepers engaged in this hazardous mission were slight. The Germans, though surprised by our attack in relatively rough weather, were quick to contest the invasion. The coastal defenses, which they had spent years in preparing for this moment, were readied for action without delay. In the early morning hours, just before each hour, when Allied troops were scheduled to set foot on French soil, the showdown battle of Europe was begun. While the troops prepared to go ashore, the savage battle for domination of the beaches started. Allied warships trained their heavy guns on the German coastal defenses, which had not been knocked out by the Allied air bombardment. As usual, the destroyers, in closer to the beach, drew the enemy's fire. With their targets spotted, the warships went into action. While the battle raged on, the transports prepared to send their troops ashore. The men embarked calmly on the last leg of their trip. For some, this was their first time in action. After the planes and the warships had done their jobs, the final outcome of the mighty battle depended largely on the infantrymen. The GIs and the landing boats were fully aware that they were the center of attention. Springing to the defense of their European fortress, the Germans prepared to mass their strength in the area of our landings for a heavy counterblow. Somehow they hadn't been expecting an Allied landing at that exact time. For the troops, this was it. 
British and Canadians forming the British Second Army landed on the left flank of the assault against determined Nazi opposition. On the right flank, the American First Army troops stormed ashore under heavy enemy fire. Our victory in World War II hung in the balance. Three American divisions poured ashore on Omaha and Utah beaches and fought desperately for a foothold. It looked like a tough battle ahead with the issue very much in doubt. It was a tough battle, and American prospects for the immediate future were anything but bright. Casualties on D-Day were heavy, especially on Omaha Beach. 3,000 American soldiers were killed, wounded, and missing on Omaha Beach alone on that first day. Along some of the beaches, landing conditions were highly unfavorable. Some of the landing boats were badly swamped and the soldiers in them had a grueling time making the shore. They were in no condition at all to battle the Germans. Fortunately, the number of men who had to be pulled out of the rough sea was fairly small, and so the combat strength of their units was not seriously diminished. By D-Day afternoon, American artillery was ashore and in use. afternoon of D-Day, some of the beaches were secured, and the troops began the drive inland to keep the enemy off balance. Every Allied advance was slowed down considerably by Nazi obstacles. The French coastal area had been liberally planted with mines, which the Nazis always believed in using plentifully. Our mine detection units reaped an abundant harvest in the country near the beaches. Although the offensive was hampered by the innumerable Nazi mines, the detection units cleared the areas quickly, enabling the troops to move forward without much delay. Complicating the problem on the American front was the prevalence of formidable hedgerows in the Bocage country. In almost every row were hidden machine gunners or small combat teams who were in perfect position to decimate our infantry as they doggedly crawled and crept to the attack along every avenue of approach. In their drive up the peninsula toward Cherbourg, the GIs of the First Army, all veterans now, hammered at the Nazis without let up. There were no large-scale surrenders but enough prisoners were taken to supply Allied intelligence officers with up-to-the-minute information about the enemy. During the first week's fighting, Allied casualties mounted with appalling swiftness to thousands of dead, wounded, and missing. As the conflict wore on, I grew constantly more bitter against the Germans, particularly the Hitler gang. On all sides, there was always evidence of the destruction that Hitler's ruthless ambition had brought about. Every battle, every skirmish demanded its price in broken bodies and in the extinction of the lives of young Allied soldiers. Hundreds of broken-hearted fathers, mothers, and sweethearts wrote me personal letters begging for some hope that a loved one might still be alive. Every one of these I answered and I know of no more effective means of developing an undying hatred of those responsible for aggressive war than to assume the obligation of attempting to express sympathy to families bereaved by it. Wreckage littered the landing areas, particularly at Omaha Beach, where rough seas and very heavy German fire 
resulted in the disabling of quantities of our landing craft. On June 7th, the day following the first landings, General Eisenhower, accompanied by his naval commander-in-chief, Admiral Ramsey, toured the assault area offshore by destroyer. The weather had improved considerably, thus making it possible for the Allies to follow up their initial success by quickly landing reinforcements and large quantities of material. The period from D-Day to our decisive breakout was a definite phase of the Allied operation. From the day we landed, the battle never settled down, except in isolated spots, to anything resembling the trench warfare of the First World War. But it was the possibility of such an eventuality that we could never forget. Bradley had predicted that the capture of Cherbourg was going to be a rather nasty job, and counted on speed and boldness as much as upon the strength of his assaulting forces to gain an early decision in that area. His estimate was, 10 days if we are lucky, 30 if we are not. All such predictions depended, of course, upon our success in maintaining the scheduled buildup. Landing tables provided in great detail for the daily and hourly arrival of given quantities of every kind of fighting unit, sandwiched in between the ammunition and other supplies which were required, not only for the daily operations, but to provide the reserves to sustain continuous action once we should pass to the decisive stages of the battle. 